So we're moving into a new block. Uh, we're going to talk, we're going to get all kinds of hairy detail about uh, clay and clay mineralogy and then uh, talk about uh, the structure of, of um, coarse grain soils. And I've got basically three um, little pieces of this module and I think what's going to happen is we're, we're going to get through one and a half of them today and one and a half of them on Tuesday. Tuesday. So we may not get through both of these today, they're kind of long. Uh, but we're going to start with clay mineralogy. Um, so I think it's a, it, there are entire courses in clay mineralogy. So and we're going to cover clay mineralogy in uh, one and a half lessons or something like that. So, so there's clearly a limit to the depth that I that I want you to understand it. I've given you some really good readings, and I think for geotechnical engineers, Mitchell and Soga is by far the best text for that. And and um, we used to have access to an e-version of it at the library, and unfortunately we don't anymore. I've given you a couple chapters out of it. Um, but if you want, if you decide you ever, if you ever get anything where you really need to know a lot more about clay mineralogy, that's the, that's the reference that you want to use. That's a great uh, reference on your library shelf. Um, so I, and we're going to basically talk about the three main mineral types that we run into, the, the three predominant ones. There are many others, and some of them are very important. Chlorite can be very important, and adipulgite can be very important, but we're not going to talk about those. We're going to talk about illite, kaolinite, and montmorillonite, or smectite, which is also bentonite is a type of, of uh, montmorillonite. Um, the term activity is going to be an important term for you to understand, and because we're, we're going to be talking about that as, as a, a generic term for how a, a soil's ability to absorb and hold on to water. Um, and then there are these four um, properties of clays that, uh, or either characteristics or properties of clays that are really important to understanding what, how active a clay is going to be. And, and you need to be able to describe those and define those, those terms. Um, and the rest, you'll notice in these other two, um, you'll notice in these other two um, areas, um, I've said you need to describe qualitatively. This is where th this is where I'm trying to limit the level that we get into clay mineralogy. So I, I want you to understand that, that clay mineralogy is all about surface chemistry and surface charges. You need to describe how those occur and how they're related to these four properties. But I don't expect you to sit out there and do the calculations. We're not going to be doing that. But I want you to be able to describe how they're how they're uh, both the surface charges and the edge edge charges because those are key to understanding clay structure and clay behavior. All right, so let's let's go back and just talk about minerals to begin with. So those of you that had some um, geology, uh, some of this may be familiar to you. So we're going to look at, um, you know, it, mo most of the not all parent rocks are igneous, but m m uh, you know the most of the rock all rocks originally were igneous, you know, and then some of them turned into soils and and uh, weathered and moved out someplace and became you know turned into uh, and then got. Uh, turned into sedimentary rocks. Others got metamorphosed into metamorphic rocks, but originally everything's uh, an igneous rock. And if we look at igneous rocks, and th this is a very general statement, but we look at their composition, they're mostly feldspars. Um, uh, and then the next largest constituent is really what I, probably is better, not, not just amphiboles, but what I generally we refer to as the dark minerals. Amphiboles is the largest uh, group of that, but there are other dark minerals out there. And then there's a fair amount of quartz, and then maybe a little mica, and after that there's a bunch of other stuff. But, but the, by far the largest constituents are the feldspars, the amphiboles, and the quartz. Now we go down to the beach, unless you're in Punalu'u in Hawaii or other place where there's black sand beaches, which are there because of a, they happen, you know, the beach happens to be very close to some brand new, very, very young, uh, 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 lava that's immediately gets turned into sand immediately in terms of geologic time. If you're any place where the beach is some distance from the parent rock, the beach is all quartz. Maybe a little mica. Well, what happened to all the rest of that stuff? You know, what happened to the what happened to the other 75 74 percent of the rock mass? It's not on the it ain't, it ain't on the beach in sand. So, well, that other 74% turned into clay minerals. 
And they're not on the beach in sand because they're much smaller and, and they're, they're not going to deposit in, on the beach. So they're being deposited in lacustrine environments or marine environments where they have a chance to settle out and become, you know, become clay, clay deposits. Um, but they're not on the beach uh, because they don't survive the, the, the chemical, uh, they don't survive the chemical weathering process. So this is a nice um, cross-section of a uh, Northern California granite, El Capitan granite. And if we look at this, can you, you guys, can you guys identify the minerals? Anybody can identify the minerals in there? You guys have done this before in your geology classes? The dark stuff is, well, the, the, the amphiboles, right? The, the, that's the dark minerals. And then if you look at that, can you see that, can you see there's actually two kind of, there's a grayish and, and there's a grayish with kind of a reflective surface and then there's a real whitish mineral there, right? So what are those two? The, 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 uh, the one that's got shiny, it's a more grayish, that's the quartz. And the white stuff is the feldspar. In this case, they have a, a white feldspar. Many places, if you see pink granite, a lot of people see pink granite. The pink is feldspar. In that case, it's K feldspar. It's potassium feldspar, and the, and the potassium is what makes it pink. So this is a different kind of feldspar. Uh, so that's the quartz. The reason you can tell, the, like here's, here's a quartz mineral. The reason you tell it's quartz and it's got that, reason it's got that shiny surface is it's quartz fractures on, on, on uh, some flat planes and it reflects the light better. So that's quartz. Um, those are the amphiboles. Again, dark minerals could be stuff other than amphibole, but predominantly they'll be amphiboles. And then th these are the feldspars. You can see there's a lot of feldspar in this. See, there's a big blob of feldspar there. Well, the quartz is going to end up on the beach pretty much in a night, you know, nice three-dimensional pieces of sand, because that's very resistant to chemical weathering, where these other minerals are are not nearly as as resistant to chemical weathering, so they're going to undergo chemical changes. Where the quartz is going to undergo mechanical. I mean, it's going to roll down the hill. It's going to, you know, if you're up here, we you know we've got our we got our Claremont bowl, uh, Claremont potatoes, right? We got these rocks all over the place, and as they get work their way down to the sea here, it's not very far, but they're, they're going to get beat up and crushed and, you know, and broken into smaller pieces, but they're still, but the quartz is going to remain quartz. The rest of that stuff, it's going to get chemically altered and, and, and it's going to wash away and end up other places. So, let's talk about minerals. So, quartz uh, is SiO2, it's a tetrasilicated form, it's a three-dimensional lattice structure. It's a very strong structure, it's three-dimensional. Um, um, I didn't try and draw the quartz structure, but it's a three-dimensional structure. You know, if you think of a space lattice, sometimes you see these two-dimensional space lattices in, uh, you know, in, in the roofs of sports centers and stuff. You think of that in three dimensions, it's very strong, very hard to attack. It's, it's chemically balanced as SiO2. Uh, in contrast, the feldspars are a uh, tetrosilicate. I know that's an exciting term. Uh, but I've got pictures of those. So this is this is SI. Uh, well, this this is the silica tetrahedron, which is SiO4. But when you put a, when you put these together three dimensionally, if you if you put these all together three dimensionally for quartz, it's the the, the composition is going to be SiO2. The uh, feldspars put those quartz together in in this lattice structure that's fairly open. Let's see. I want to do this. I, I updated this uh, sketch up today, and I'll post the, the latest one to you. But you, you have a copy of this, and you can play with it if you want to see. But if you can see, there's this, there's a pair of, uh, I mean, there's there's four silica tetrahedra here, and uh, I hate it when this thing does this. Can't get it to do it the way I want it. There we go. Uh, so there's four of them here, and then there's four of them here that kind of face the opposite direction, if you can see that. So, but this lattice structure, notice this lattice structure is pretty open. 
So it's a lot more open to both, both chemical and, and, and mechanical weathering. So it's not nearly as strong as the, as the quartz uh, lattice structure, which is all built out in three dimensions. So this is really, th there's a three-dimensional aspect to this, but it's pretty much two-dimensional along this axis. So that's the, the feldspar um, structure. The ample bowls um, are even um, more weakly structured. The ample bowls um, are in this, um, this two-line structure here. So the ample bowl keeps going on forever and ever in this direction and this direction. And you can see there's, there's one chain here and one chain here that are the same chains, essentially. And, 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 and it's a flat structure. Uh, but it's, it's, a, it's basically a two-chain structure. So there's this, there's this chain that runs along this axis and that one. And they're joined here just here at, at these um, oxygens here. So that's the amphibole structure. So both the feldspars and the amphiboles um, are subject to chemical weathering. And, and, and when they break down, and I just showed the silica part of their structures. There's more than silica in them. There's, there's um, cations attached to those, but I was showing the, silica, the silicate structure part of it. When they break down, they generally, the, the silicates generally form into two-dimensional lattice sheets that are the constituent of our, um, our clay minerals. And there's two main sheets that are formed. The, 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 the uh, quartz um, 3D lattice uh, in the quartz doesn't break down nearly as much. And it's basically not, it's not insusceptible to uh, chemical weathering, but it's very, very strong uh, compared to these, to the structures I showed you in the, in the feldspars and the amphiboles. So the, the, those minerals break down and, we, and end up forming sheets, uh, which if you've ever played with mica or biotite, you know, you can peel that off in sheets. It's really the same structure. It's just, I mean, that's at a very, 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 there's, there's a lot of those layers stacked together in that. Um, so we're going to end up with that, that part of the silica that's in quartz, which is in a 3D structure, is going to stay that way and just get physically weathered, where that stuff that's in either these strings or these, or these 2D structures is going to weather chemically into clay, mineral, clay minerals. So let's talk about the basic building blocks for the clay mineral structures. So um, we're going to talk about two different units. The, the lowest level is what we're going to talk about, a sheet. We're going to talk about sheets and layers. So if you think about your bed, right, you got a sheets. You put a lot of sheets on the bed. You know, you got sheets and blankets. That makes a layer of something. So sheets is the lowest level uh, a unit in the clay mineral, the way we're going to talk about that. So that, when I say sheets, we mean the, the thinnest stuff. So there's two, there's two sheets that are important to us. One's the silica sheet, which has a tetrahedral structure, which we, we're, we'll, we'll look at again here. Um, the unit, the smallest sil silica unit uh, uh, is SI4010, and you notice that's got a minus four uh, valence on it. So this is, the, this is the silica tetrahedron, and if I put them together in a sheet, it's going to look like this. This looks a lot like the, like the uh, amphiboles, except that the amphiboles are basically just the two long strings. The amphiboles would only, be, would only have this, would, would only have the lower half of the structure, and it would be these two long strings, and the silica sheet goes on and on uh, forever in two dimensions. So it's this, it's this sheet, if you can imagine, I've only drawn a little bit of it, but it goes on and on in two dimensions. There's my silica sheet. Okay, and that has, if we, you know, if we, do the, if, we, if we do the little chemistry right, we'll find out that, that the, 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 a unit of that, the, the elemental unit of that is right here. Can't draw on this thing. It's right here, and that uh, has a charge of SI4 or 10 minus 4. So if I have a sheet of those, for every elemental unit, I got a minus 4 charge on it. So that, that sheet has got a negative charge, which is obviously going to have to be balanced by something. The other sheet is an octahedral sheet, and there's two forms of that. There's one, that, and it's an octahedral sheet with hydroxyls, OHs, and there's a magnesium form and there's aluminum form, and the aluminum form is the most common one, which is gibbsite, 
And the, uh, and the magnesium form is, is brucite. I always remember gibbsite because it's it, aluminum is gibbsite. And I just think of Al Gibbs, right? Obviously, you didn't grow up in the 70s, did you? you heard of the Bee Gees? Yeah, OK. Al Gibbs is one of the founding Bee Gees. So, um, so the octahedral uh, sheets look uh, This is the basic unit is um, you have six hydroxyls. And um, then you either have a magne aluminum or magnesium in, in the center of that. Um, so if it's aluminum, it's gibbsite. And if it's magnesium, it's brucite. So that's the basic the basic unit. And when, it, when it's built into a sheet, they come together like this. And you can see that you have these uh, sheets of the of octahedral sheets that get built together like that. So that's the octahedral structure. And again, I've given you the SketchUp if you want to play with it and spin it around and see, see it some more. OK. so. Notice that these sheets are, are, are chemically balanced and have no charges. The octahedral sheets don't have a charge, but the silica sheets have a negative charge. So if we put sheets together, we get layers. And the layers are two to four sheets, which make up the, the, the smallest unit that we would call a, a certain clay mineral. Um, so this is just, this is in case my SketchUp isn't working. There's your tetrahedron, silica tetrahedron. There's your silica sheet. Um, th well, this one is your silica. This is your silica unit sh unit cell. This is the smallest amount of tetrahedrons you can put together to get a silica sheet cell. This is the sheet. Um, here's your um, uh, octahedral unit and your octahedral sheet. And then we put those together to get clay structures. So kaolinite has a structure that's a single oct the, 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 a layer of kaolinite, the smallest unit you can put together and have kaolinite, is one uh, sheet of one octahedral sheet and one tetra tetrahedral sheet joined together. And the, the, um, the tetrahedron gets, the, the oxygen gets bumped off and they share an OH at the points where they join. Uh, and this, we, you know, obviously drawing all those. Um, tetrahedrons and octahedrons is a real pain in the butt. So we use this real, this very simple shorthand uh, structure and when we're uh, talking about clay minerals. And for, for the octahedral sheet, we use just a rectangle to represent the octahedral sheet. And then uh, for the tetrahedral sheet, um, we use this um, trapezoidal shape to represent the tetrahedral sheet. So when you're drawing these things, I think your next homework, I make you draw these things just to show that you know how to do them. Um, the octahedral sheets are rectangle, and the tetra tetrahedral sheet. And the, and the, the point, the shortest end of the tetra tetrahedral sheet is, represents the top of the tetrahedrons. Remember in this, um, there, there's clearly an orientation to this sheet, right? There's a pointy side of the sheet. And there's a not pointy side of the sheet. You know, there's a side of the sheet that will puncture your tires if you drove over it, and the other side of the sheet that won't. And and the um, when we're drawing this short term for it, um, the the short side of our of our um, trapezoid is represents the pointy side of the sheet. So that's our that's our layer of kaolinite. Uh, we'll go to here and. So this is the kaolinite sheet, and, and you can see here how they're joined together. And if I can do this right and zoom in here, um, boy, it gets confusing. Here's what I want to do, right there. So here's a place right here where here's your um, th three of your four oxygens. Here's a fourth location on your circle tetrahedron. And, and that oxygen is going to get bumped off, and they're going to share the, the hydroxyl from the octahedral sheet. And, and you notice that not every, um, not every um, top of the tetrahedron is actually bonded in there. This one's not bonded, but that one is. So that's the, um, the kaolinite structure. 
um, um, the illite structure and the montmorillonite have the same um, sheets put together to form a structure. In these cases, they have a octahedral, they have a tetrahedral sheet on top and the bottom pointed towards each other with an octahedral sheet in between. And so the shorthand for that uh, basic layer is, looks like that, where there's a tetrahedron on the, tetra, there's a trapezoid on the top and a rectangle in the middle and a trapezoid in the bottom. And that one looks like this. I gotta re, re uh, I mislabeled that one layer. But that, that looks like this. And, and all, all, all it is, you take this um, sheet, this tetrahedral sheet on the bottom, you flip it over, flip it over and put it on the top, and it points down on the top. So this is the unit building block for both illite and montmorillonite. Okay, so let's talk about surface charges now. We're going to get into a little chemistry. So the octahedral sheets are, are um, uh, generally balanced. You, the, for the Gibbs side, it's Al206 as a unit. And um, for brookside, it's Mg3006. And those are, those are electrically balanced. But the, tetrahed the tetrahedral sheets are not balanced. They're, they're as we said before, si si 4010 is going to have a negative 4 charge. So how are we going to balance that charge out? Well, if we, um, if we replace 402s with uh, uh, o, um, O2 minus with OH minus 1, then that'll balance it out. So when the when the, the tetrahedral sheet and the octahedral sheet bond, if you can re, if you can bond that, if you can replace the, uh, four of the uh, o, o two o two minuses with the OH minus one, that'll balance it out. Or we they can bond with some sheet that's got a positive charge somehow. Or they can attract uh, uh, cations that have a positive charge. So that's one. That's how they can be balanced. In practice. There will always be a negative balance. There will always be negative charges on the uh, the clay um, layers, the fundamental clay layers, because one, there's broken edges, and you can't ever bond at the edges. So there's always going to be some charge at the edges, and two, because of a phenomenon called isomorphous substitution, which is really important, and that's one of those vocabulary words for you for today. So let's talk about isomorphous substitution. So isomorphous substitution is when the cations in the, in the lattice structure are replaced with a, with a, with a cation of lower valence, right? So uh, what's our uh, ion here in the middle of the tetrahedral sheet, our cation? Silicate, which is Si minus, I'm sorry, plus, O, o minus 2 Si plus 4. Well, if, you, if, if that SI gets bumped out of there and you, and you, and you stick an aluminum plus 3, or if you stick ferrous or ferric, if you put one of the irons in there, what are you doing to the, the net charge in, in, in the, the tetrahedral sheet? You're lowering it, because you're taking a plus 4 and replacing it with a plus 3 or a plus 2. So if you have isomorphous substitution, which means not every one of your silicas is actually really a silica, there's some you know, rude neighbor came in, took over your house, bumped the, you know, bumped Mr. Silica out, you know, Mr. Aluminum came in, had a party, he's only plus three, and so there's going to be a greater negative charge. So, so I, that's what isomorphous substitution is. You can have isomorphous substitution also in the uh, octahedral layer. If you have um, gibbsite and you're, you have aluminum plus three, if magnesium gets substituted in there, which happens commonly, that's only plus two. Uh, if you had the magnesium, which is plus two, and you substitute, the, if you were a, a brookside uh, octahedral layer and you had mag magnesium, but you substitute that with, uh, with uh, sodium, then you, that's going to go from plus two to plus one. So you can get, even if you, even if you bonded perfectly the octahedral layer with the tetrahedral layer with enough substitution of OHs for Os to get the layers theoretically bonded. If there's any isomorphic substitution, there's still going to be a net negative charge on, on the, on the uh, clay layers. So in practical purposes, clay layers always have negative charges on the, the faces of the sheets. The edges are a different story, and we'll talk about them later because there's a, there's a water interaction that controls those. 
So the magnitude of the negative charge, if you want to think of the charge per unit area, is going to be a function of both the, the valence of the substitution, right? If you're substituting Al plus 3 for Si plus 4, you're going to get one negative charge for every substitution. But if you're substituting ferric, ferric, ferrous, I don't remember which one's which, uh, but if you're substituting plus 2 for plus 4, you're obviously going to get two negative charges for every substitution. If you substitute Na uh, plus 1 for aluminum plus 3, then you're going to get 2. So it's going gonna, it's gonna to depend on the valence and the amount of substitution occurring. So those are the two most important parameters that are going to determine how negative we get. Okay, we measure this amount of negativity, the amount of bad attitude in a clay, uh, but we, what we call the cation exchange ratio. So that's, uh, that's the electron, the mega electron equivalence, that's what this means, M EQ, M for mega, EQ for electron equivalence, so one electron charge, per 100 grams of material. You notice that we're gonna do a lot of these these relative measurements with clay minerals per gram of material. We do that because it's easy to measure and because the specific gravity of the clay minerals isn't that much different, or, or almost all minerals for that matter of fact, at least the ones we're interested in, isn't that different. Um, so, and it's easy to measure that. So rather than doing it per unit volume or something like that, we'll do it per gram. So this is the, the, the mega electron equivalence per 100 grams of material. So that's something you can titrate, for instance. You can just do a titration. You just weigh out your dry clay minerals, put it, you know, make, put it in an aqueous solution. It's going to have a negative charge. You titrate it till it has a neutral charge, and you can calculate the, the, uh, the cation exchange capacity. OK. Now we need to do a little chemistry review, because experience tells me nobody remembers this stuff. Not much, though. I promise you it's not too much. Even you can handle this. Okay, bonding. The strongest bonds in uh, chemical bonds are covalent and ionic bonds. So there's two flavors of covalent bonding. Um, the one is what's called nonpolar covalent bonding. So uh, uh, this is so co covalent bonding is sharing of electrons. It's when two uh, two atoms get together and they say, "Hey, you're missing one, and I'm missing one. Let's share." So this is a, so a very common one is iodine. I2 is a very strong structure, strong chemical structure. It's hard to break apart. And that's because uh, the, the iodine uh, atom has this extra slot for uh, an electron, each of them, and they can get together and share them. And they're very nice people, and they share them equally. And neither one of them is trying to be you know, greedy and grasp more than one of the other one. Which, so, so, they're very, so it's a very strong bond. Another one that's very common is O2. Uh, in the case of O2, they actually share two pairs because they've got spots for two pairs. And the symbols we use for, the, for, uh, for covalent bonding is we put a line between the, the two uh, atoms that are sharing, and a single one means that it's a, uh, a um, single pair sharing, and in the case of O2, it's a dual pair sharing. So there is a, a, a covalent bonding uh, that's polar where one guy is a little bigger than the other one and a little more greedy than the other one and says, well, I'd like, uh, I'm a short one and you're a short one, so let's share, but I'm going to share more than you. And so the, the, the extra electron spends more time on one side than the other. In this case, the electron spends more time with the uh, chlorine than with the uh, hydrogen. And so even though there's poor, there's, uh, it's a, even, even though they're sharing uh, the, uh, the electron, one side of this tends to be charged uh, uh, negative uh, more often than the other one, the other one positive more often than the other one. And so it's a little easier to break those apart. Um, oops. Um, the, the, the other primary bond, which is still strong in terms of, of, uh, of, of chemical bonds, but the weakest of the primary bonds is ionic bonding. And ionic bonding is when uh, one of the uh, atoms just steals the electron from the other one, and then there's a charge difference, a, a plus one and a minus one charge difference. Notice in the, 
in this polar non, non-sharing bond, I use plus and minus delta, which is less than an electron equivalent, where when there's ionic bonding, it's actually plus one and min- minus one because it's a full electron equivalent. So in that case, the chlorine steals the, uh, the ion, uh, the ion, steals the electron from the sodium, and, and, and there's, a, there's a bonding there. That's still, uh, uh, these are both primary bonds, and if, when, when chemists look at this stuff, very carefully, it, look, it turns out that in many of these cases, the primary bonds are actually some percent covalent, some percent ionic, and you can see when chemists look at this, they talk about the percent ionic and percent covalent. For our purposes, these are primary bonds and they're very strong. So the, second, the next level of bonding in terms of, of its capacity is what's called secondary bonding, which is, so uh, this is inter, interatomic or intramolecular, this one is intermolecular, so it's really, uh, it's not a fundamental atomic bond. Um, the strongest of the weak bonds, so this is the, this is the weak bonds, but in the weak bond world, there are strong ones and weak ones. So the strongest of the, of the um, intermolecular or secondary bonding is hydrogen bonding. So hydrogen bonding when you, is when you have a polar molecule that has a permanent dipole, and the, uh, the, di- and, and the dipoles are attracted, uh, which, uh, for the, and it's, it's, a, it's specifically a bond formed by the hydrogen ions, which is why it's called hydrogen, hydrogen bonding. And generally it's with, uh, uh, most commonly with O2 minus, but it could be with other uh, ca- uh, anions such as fluorine. Um, but it's, the most common one is H with O2. And so the, a very common hydrogen bond we see is with, with water where the water molecules are polar and you can get a, per, and you get a, you know, that's why, that's why water is, um, 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 that's why it's good for washing your hands, that's why it's good for cleaning, cleaning uh, your dirty laundry, you know, and, and why we see capillary action because there's a, there's a, there's a fairly strong dipole there uh, and, the, and the water actually bonds to itself fairly strongly. The, the weaker class are all called Van, uh, Van der Waals bonds. There's, uh, traditionally, two types of Van der Waal bonds. I think if you read uh, more recent chemistry stuff, there's different ways to describe these, but um, for our purposes, this will work. The first one is when we have dipoles, uh, even, even with an O2, the electrons don't spend all their time perfectly around each, each of the um, atoms, and, and they wander around, so there's times in which they're charged, there's a slight positive charge on one side and one of the negative. So this is my little cool little uh, animation of that is that these um, um, these electric charges actually fluctuate back and forth and as they fluctuate back back and forth there's negative charge the, the negative and positive charges are going to attract each other but since they're fluctuating they could one could fluctuate the other way and the other one wouldn't in which there wouldn't be a bond so they there's a bond there's a there's an elect, uh, electrostatic bond there but because the the dipole is not a permanent dipole uh, it's not nearly as strong because it kind of comes and goes and then, um, ah, going the wrong way. Um, then there's a dipole-dipole uh, reaction, which is which occurs between two permanent um, dipoles. But again, so like remember in the HCl, we had this we had this uh, 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 unequal sharing of the electrons. So there's a small electrical charge. It's not a full electron charge, but there is a dipole there, and so there's a dipole attraction there. The point of this is the hydrogen bonds, uh, th- these, are all, these are all secondary bonds, right? These aren't our primary bonds. But these secondary bonds, if we start with the hydrogen bond, it's, it's, it's the strongest of them. And as we get down to these Van der Waals bonds or Van der Waals forces, I think sometimes, I, I think in some uh, texts now, they just kind of combine all these Van der Waal forces, the bonds together, and they actually just call them Van der Waal forces. Um, they're um, much less strong, and so we decrease in strength as we go from the from the hydrogen bond to the Van der Waals dispersion bonds to the Van der Waal dipole attraction. So, primary bonds, very, very strong. Secondary bonds, weaker. Within the secondary bonds, the hydrogen bonds are strongest, and these, and these Van der Waals forces are, are, are much less strong. All right, that's all important because now we're going to talk about uh, inner sheet bonding and inner layer bonding, right? Remember, sheets are the thinnest ones. Right? 
The, the sheet is the one thing that you put over on yourself in your bed and when, you know, the other week when it was 95. When it's cold in the winter, you put a bunch of sheets together to get layers, right? So sheets are the thinnest and layers are the, you know, and then if you have a lot of beds and you stacked your beds together, you would have lots of layers. So sheets is the thinnest uh, mineral, mineral unit, layers are the thinnest clay mineral unit, and then you stack uh, clay layers together and, and you get clay pieces or clay, clay, uh, clay, uh, yeah, clay pieces, I guess is the best way to say it. All right, the inner sheet bonding is always a primary bond. It's usually a mix of ionic and covalent bonding, but for our purposes, it's strong, and for our purposes, it's, it's not getting broken within the domain of soil mechanics that we're concerned about. So I wouldn't call them permanent bonds, but as far as, you know, unless we're going to actually have chemical actions that actually change the chemistry of our clays, which, by the way, does happen in, um, I mean, it, it does happen. Uh, people that worry about these um, clay liners for uh, landfills and stuff actually do have to worry about this kind of stuff because there is chemical stuff going on there. And if you're interested in that, you need to go to Wisconsin and work with Craig Benson. Um, so those are primary bonds. The inner layer bonds are always secondary bonds. Um, they're either, if they're hydrogen bonds, so, so the, the things that's bonding the clay layers together into, uh, um, is, um, are all secondary bonding. If they're hydrogen bonds, then, then they're, they're, uh, they're the strongest of them. If they're the Van der Waals uh, uh, forces, then they're going to be much weaker. But it's always weaker than the intersheet bonds, right? So the intersheet bonds are primary uh, bonds, very strong. The inner layer bonds are, are some form of either hydrogen bond or van der, van der Waals forces, and are going to be much later. So it's relatively easy to cleave the, lay, the clay at the, between layers. It's very, very difficult to, to cleave it between sheets. OK. so. Let's talk about the common clay minerals and, and their construction. So in kaolinite, so kaolinite is composed of the, the, the sheet is an octahedral, uh, is, is an, an octahedral uh, sh uh, combination of octahedral. The sh you have an octahedral sheet and a, and a tetrahedral sheet, which together make the single clay layer. Right? This is the single clay layer which is an octahedral sheet. An octahedral sheet and a tetrahedral sheet. The interlayer bond in kaolinite is uh, an OHH hydrogen bond. So that is the strongest of our secondary bonds. So kaolinite has relatively strong interlayer bonding. Uh, illite, the interlayer bond is is an is a it's a done with a feldspar. If you remember the illite, if you remember the if you remember the tetrahedral layers, let me go back to it's easier to see just on the tetrahedral layer. See this? See how big this this area is in the in the uh, in the um, tetrahedral layer here? It's a really big spot there, right? And the the, um, the potassium ion is really freaking big, but it fits in that spot really nicely. Now this is not uh, th this is this is again a, uh, a a dipole kind of attraction, so it's 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 not the hydrogen bond, but it's a fairly strong bond, uh, but weaker than the hydrogen bond. And when you get to montmorillonite. You just have Van der Waals forces holding the sheets together, the layers together. Excuse me. So that's the weakest of them. So if we're trying, if we want to cleave clay layers, um, you know, this is going from. Whoa, that was nice. This is going. This is going from strong. To weak, in the interlayer bonding, uh, 
realize the inter interlayer bonding is much, much weaker than the intersheet bonding, because the intersheet bonding, what kind of a bond do we have in here? Yeah, so this is a primary, this is a primary bond, um, ionic slash covalent. So that's very strong. This is very strong. All these bonds are all these all these um, these bonds are all much weaker than that primary bond, but the but the but the hydrogen bond is the strongest of them. They get weak in this direction. Okay. All right. So that's one of the things that's going to control our behavior of our clay. Uh, the other one is something called specific surface. And before I define it, let's think about this. Let's assume I have a cube that is one unit on each side, one unit by one unit by one unit, right? What's the volume of that cube? One unit, right? One cubed, one. What's the area of that cube? It's a dice. It's a dice, a single dice. So it's got an area of six, right? So the specific surface is equal to the uh, volume divided by the area. It's, it's, I'm sorry, the other way around. It's the area per unit volume, right? So what's the specific surface of this? Well, we have an area of six and a volume of one. So our specific surface here is six. In this case, it'd be, unit, it'd be whatever length we were worried about, six meters or six, right? Now what happens if I take this cube and I chop it up right down the middle in all three directions, right? Now each one of these is 0.5, right? So what is the volume of this one, this one cube here now? Well, it's got to be 1 eighth, right? Because there's eight of them. We cut, we cut the thing in equal sizes. So the volume of this is equal to 1 8. And how much area does it have? 0.5 by 0.5 is a quarter. The area of each side is a quarter, right? If you don't, if you don't think about it this way, I took, I took this face, right, and, and which was 1. I divided it in four pieces. So the area of this is 0.25, right? And I got six of those. So that's 1 and a half, right? So the volume of that is, so the area now is, um, you know, uh, 1.5, right? So what's the specific surface now? Well, the specific surface now is the volume, which is 1 eighth divided by 1 and a half is, is 3 halves, right? So that's, uh, let's see, the, the area is going on the bottom, so it's 2 thirds, right? Did I do that right? No, I didn't do that right. Is that upside down? Let's try that again. So the specific surface is the area over the volume. The area is 3 halves, right? No, it's 1 and a half. Right? The area is, three, is 1 and a half, right? So the area is 3 halves, and the volume is 1 eighth, but, it, but it's 1 over the volume, so that's 8 over 1. There we go. That's 4. This is equal to 12, right? Did I do that right? hope I did that right. So if we take something big and we break it into smaller pieces, the relative amount of surface area is going up, right? So the surface area is increasing. So that's the concept of specific surface. So let's look at it in, in um, let's talk about it. OK. So uh, surface area of multilayer units. Uh, we measure this as, uh, in, for clay minerals, rather than measuring this in units of length, we're going to measure it in meters squared per gram, again, because we can, we can measure the, the, the grams easily. So this is just the way we do it, because the 
the specific um, uh, the specific weight of these min minerals is not t terribly different. Okay. Um, so the stronger the inner layer bond, right, is going to put more layers together in a unit of clay. The stronger that, remember, the inner sheet bond's not breaking. It's that inner layer bond that we're, that we're worried about. So if we have a strong inner layer bond, we're going to basically get more layers together in a unit of clay. A piece of clay is going to have a lot more layers in it if it's got a strong inner layer bond versus a weak one. Um, and that's going to generate larger particle sizes, which is going to generate a lower specific surface. I'm, I'm doing it, in, in this case, I'm doing the opposite. I mean, just think of it this way. So here's, if I have a strong inner layer bond, these three layers might all be bonded together in a unit, right? And if I have a weak inner layer bond, they could be broken up individually. In which case, I'm going to have much smaller pieces, and a specific surface is going to go up. So a specific surface is clearly a function of the size of the particles, and that's going to be a function of the inner layer bond. So this is a really rough picture. Um, the, the size of clay minerals varies quite a bit. But, I, but these are drawn to scale. Um, um, at kind of the median scale, but th these are the relative sizes of, of kaolinite, uh, illite, and, and montmorillonite. Um, and you can see the range of these is pretty big, so it's not like these are drawn perfectly to scale, but I kind of picked the middle of the road for each of these and drew them to scale just to give you some concept of how different the sizes can be. So kaolinite, you know, somewhere between 1,000 and 20,000 ang angstroms. Obviously, that doesn't change by a factor of 20. But in, in around, uh, some, somewhere around 100 to 1,000 angstroms thick. Illite, 1 to 5,000 uh, 5, angstroms, rel relatively speaking, across. And not terribly different than the uh, kaolinite. But if you look at the Montmorillonite, it's about the same, about the same uh, size as the illite. But the thickness of it's, you know, at least one, if not two orders of magnitude thinner than, than the illite. So um, clearly, the Montmorillonite is going to have a much higher specific surface than either the illite or the kaolinite. And both the illite and the kaolinite are going to have a much higher specific surface. I'm sorry, both the illite and the Montmorillonite are going to have a much, much higher specific surface. And that's because of the inner layer bonding. So if, if you turn them on their sides, they kind of look like that. In the next part of this lecture, we're going to talk about um, double layer water. And so we'll, we'll, we'll talk about that in more, more uh, detail next, uh, in the next topic. But the inner layer water, uh, the, the thickness of the double layer water that's, that's semi-permanently attracted to the clays, it's about 400 angstrom and, angstroms in kaolinite. And it's uh, about 200 angstroms in illite. And it's about the same in Montmorillonite, but look how thin the clay layers can be there. That's why sodium bentonite has a really high wa you know, water, con wa water content at the, even at the plastic limit. So, so these, again, these are very um, uh, rough sizes because obviously they vary quite a bit, but that gives you a general idea of why we should care about the, the sizes of the clay minerals and their, and their, uh, and their actual mineralogy. Okay, and now we've got some nice pictures of them just to show you how this works. So this is kaolinite. The big guy in here, this big guy right here, that's a, that's a silt green. That's a, that's, a cord, that's a piece of quartz. That's a, that's a silt size. All right, and what do you notice about um, what do you notice about these units, chunks, whatever you want to call them, of kaolinite? Yeah, you can see the you can clearly see the layers, right? You can see cleavage, but notice how they're all stacked together. Look at look look at this look at this stack here. You know, this is like uh, you know uh, 
This is like uh, a bunch of pinnacle decks, you know, after you've been eating uh, cotton candy or something, right? They're bonded very strongly, and you can see that that see that I mean you can see how this is going to act like a unit in here. Uh, it be a, even though they're even though they're made up of the the the, the clay sheets and the and the clay layers are are the same as the other or the same as uh, when we get to uh, Montmorillonite, they're they're um, they're inner layer bonding is, is strong enough that they're going to, they, they clump together in, in uh, large groups like this and, and they're going to act in as much bigger particles. And if you look at these, um, the little white bar in these, I, I try to remember, if I, I, let's see if I drew these to scale. I think I've scaled these on them, if, if, if I remember correctly, I've scaled these relatively speaking on, when I, when I put them on the, the slides so that they're the, to the same scale. So that's five, um, five microns there, and this is 20 microns. That looks about right. So this is illite, and what do you notice about this? There's, 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 there's not nearly as many layers, right? And there's something else that's really important to this one that we're going to talk about um, in, in the next section. But. Yeah, it's like a honeycomb structure. Notice, notice how, notice how they're, they're, they're how open the structure is. You know, sort of a card house structure. You do see, by the way, see this is clearly a bunch of layers um, together, and see there's a bunch of layers together there. Um, but also notice this, um, this, uh, this is uh, a type of flocculation we'll talk about. But notice this real open structure. You see, it's not quite a card house structure, but there's definitely structure to it, right? They're not all parallel. They're all just kind of floating in the space. They're, they're, they're clearly got the edges joined together, and mostly it's edge-to-edge -edge joints. Most of the the joints joining is at edges of. If you notice this, it's at the edges like this one right here. These are all ed they're they're joined, not edge to face, but edge to edge. All right. So here's a. Um, I am told, this is much smaller. This is this is a much higher magnification because there's one micron right there. But I'm told that this is um, this is a kaolinite um, uh, piece, I guess, and this is illite. And again, you can see that the kaolinite is much chunkier. Um, you can't see the individual sheets in there; they're much too fine to be seen in this. In this, that's not like one sheet. That's that's a whole bunch of sheets together. But notice how much thinner the illite piece is than the than the kaolinite piece. And then finally, we get to um, Montmorillonite or smectite. Again, this, these, this is this is quartz, by the way. So we talked about that three-dimensional structure of quartz and how strong it is. That's a three-dimensional. You know, that's a, that's a piece of quartz. It's a silt-sized piece of quartz. So those are silt size, right? That's finer than your number 200 sieve, okay? And then you can see this uh, Montmorillonite, and look how thin the sheets are here. And again, look at the. These also have that honeycomb structure. It's a flock. It's what's called flocculation, a flocculated structure. But look how thin the sheets are. And th this one is about th it's the same scale as the other two. This is uh, 6.67 microns, and if that's about the same. If we go back here, it's about the same as this five micron one. So it's relatively the same scale. Notice how much smaller the sheets the, the are than they are in um, either there or here, right? And finally, this is a really, uh, so this is 10 microns right here. So this is very, very uh, high resolution. And notice how, notice how in this one, this is again uh, Montmorillonite. Notice that it almost, I mean, it almost looks like, like uh, phyllo or something. You know, this looks like, like you took the baklava and peeled it off in individual sheets or something. Um, I mean, it, it almost looks like you could look through it. It, 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 there is evidence that sometimes the, Benton, the, the Montmorillonites will separate into individual clay layers, down to the, the individual clay layers. That the, that bonding can be so weak if the water chemistry is right. So you have just a single, you have one, you know, one octahedral sheet and one tetrahedral sheet, and they're 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 all by themselves. All right. So let's do a, let's do our quick summary, and then we'll be at the end of the first half. Um, so, so so activity is 
the, uh, if you want to think of, that we, we think of active clays as clays that can actively uh, absorb and hold on to water. Um, we measure this by the cation exchange ratio um, in uh, mega electron equivalents per, per 100 grams. That is a function of, what's it a function of? Specific surface. What's going to control how negative things are? Isomorphous substitution. Let's see if we get them all in before I flip them down. Yeah, and the interlayer bonding, right? So it's going to be it's going to be a, a function of the degree and type of of, uh, of isomorphous substitution. What's the what, what, we, degree is how much isomorphous substitution goes on, and the type. What are we talking about? Type when we say type. Besides 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 the number of of ions that are substituted, what's important about the isomorphous substitution that contributes to the charge? Yeah, yeah, the valence of the the valence during substitution very good, um, and then particle size. Particle size is going to be driven by the inner layer bond, and we're going to measure that in specific surfaces, uh, meters uh, squared per gram. Um, so it's the amount of isomorphic substitution and the strength of the inner layer bonds. That's what's going to control um, the activity of a, of a clay, the, act, the activity potential. Um, so what affects the negative surface charges? The degree of isomorphic substitution. The strength of the interlayer bond, and this, and we measure that as uh, and which which leads to measurements of the specific surface. Specific surface is controlled by particle size and interlayer bonding. I think that's, and we measure the cation exchange. And whoops. Measure the cation exchange ratio is in mEg per 100 grams. That's how we measure it. Okay, so let's do a little, then this table, uh, thank you so much, I'm so glad that you finished your update. Um, this table, uh, you, this is like a very slimmed down version of the table in chapter four of um, Mitchell and Soga, I think it's chapter four. He's got an, there's a really nice table in there that lists all the common clay mineral types that shows you the, uh, it shows you the structure. It talks about the level of isomorphous substitution. Um, it shows you the um, level of isomorphous substitution. Let me go like this. The level of isomorphous substitution. It shows you the cation exchange ratio. It talks about the inner layer bonding of a specific surface. So this is a this is a summary of just the three most common ones. So kaolinite, and you should th this is something that you should know. So kaolinite, the structure is. Um, a single octahedral and a single tetrahedral layer. It has, it has quite low isomorphous substitution. The cation exchange ratio is somewhere between 0 0.03 and 1. The interlaying bond is the hydrogen bond, so that's the strongest of the secondary bonds. And we end up with a specific surface in the range of 10 to 20 uh, meters per gram. Illite has the three layer, uh, the layer is a three sheet structure, uh, an octahedral layer sandwiched between two tetrahedral layers. It has this K bond in the middle, which is a moderately strong bond. Cation exchange ratio is, I'm sorry, the isomorphous substitution is moderate, not, not really high. Uh, so the cation exchange ratio, it's about an order of magnitude higher, maybe twice to an order of magnitude higher than that of kaolinite. That K bond in the middle is relatively strong when it comes to the secondary bondings. And we get a specific surface area that's five to 10 times as great. And finally, we get to our favorite player and the most fun clay to play with in all the world, which is Montmorillonite. Um, it has the same uh, layer structure as illite. The difference is there's a much, much higher is isomorphous substitution you can see the isomorphous, the, 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 uh, the cation exchange ratio is um, as, as much as two orders of magnitude higher than kaolinite. 
And when you combine, and, and maybe one order of magnitude, uh, you know, again, uh, uh, five to one order of magnitude, five times the one order of magnitude greater than illite. And when you combine that with this very, very weak inner layer bond, which is the inner layer bond is, is, is just a van der Waals forces, you can get specific surfaces uh, of 50 to 800 meters squared per gram. So at 800 meters squared per gram, how many grams do I need to cover a football pitch? It's like five grams. So somewhere between five and 10 grams of Montmorillonite, if you could spread it out, if you could peanut butter spread it, it would cover either your American or your international, your American football field or your international football pitch, roughly speaking. That's how much surface area there is in bentonite. That's a lot of surface area. And it's got a cation exchange ratio that you know is about 10 times, 10 to 100 times more than that of kaolinite. So that's our most active clay. Anybody play, play with bentonite? Yeah, yeah. Okay, I think, yes, all right, that's the end of the first half.